O mighty Helios and Vesta, send forth thy needle rays of illumination's flame. Pierce the veil, pierce the veil of ignorance. Consume then the poison of ignorance. Blaze forth thy light, O great central sun, Alpha and Omega. We call forth the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who have come with Lord Gautama. We call to all who saw the Lord in all levels of the etheric octave and beyond. We call the mighty Buddhas out of Nirvana for the enlightenment of the light bearers in the earth, the restoration of the mind of God in all. Oh, let that mind of God, which was in the Lord Buddha Gautama, the Lord Christ Jesus, be also in us and all servants of God this day. O oh God, deliver this people from the misuse of the sacred fire that does compromise their cosmic Christ intelligence. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother, we dedicate this lecture to the victory of enlightenment in all souls of God, worlds without end, and to the defeat of ignorance and all darkness and death and hell itself. In the name Jesus Christ, we stand for the victory, and we accept it now in the heart of mighty victory. Amen. My lecture today unfolds from the wisdom of the Rai Ernan. The Rai Ernan, as he was called, ruled Swern, India, as she was 13,000 years ago. I have titled my lecture, Ignorance of the Law is No Excuse. This is the mandate of the great law that has come down to us from Rai Ernan. Rai means emperor. His people preferred self-ignorance to self-knowledge, and they lived to pay the price of their folly, as we shall see. What is true in spiritual law is true in secular law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance is never an excuse because the attitude of ignorance is one of ignorance. It is a willful ignoring, whether conscious or unconscious, of the laws as well as the wisdom of God and man. Tibetan Buddhism teaches that there are five poisons which are of ultimate danger to our souls. The wisdoms of the five Dhyani Buddhas are believed to counteract or provide the antidote for each poison. But all of the poisons are said to evolve out of the one poison of ignorance. The five poisons are ignorance, then anger, hate and hate creation, then spiritual, intellectual, and human pride, then the poisons of the passions, all cravings, covetousness, greed, and lust, and finally, envy and jealousy. The wisdom of the Dhyani Buddha, Vairoshana, overcomes the poison of ignorance. His wisdom is the all-pervading wisdom of the Dharma Dhatu. Dharma Dhatu means literally realm of Dharma. It is the realm of truth, of highest reality, or of universal law. The Dharma Dhatu is sometimes equated with the Dharmakaya. The Dharmakaya means literally the body of the Dharma or law. It is the absolute, the embodied law, the reality of all beings. The Dharmakaya is the great causal body, wherein is the I Am Presence. Vairoshana's mantra is Om, Vairoshana, Om. So today we deal with the poison of ignorance and we explore how this poison has poisoned the mind and the stream of consciousness. I believe that in all of us there is a compartment of consciousness, of ignorance, and that we must go after it so that we do not ever again fail to uphold the laws of God. We do not ignore the voice of the inner Christ. 
Ignorance is the chief enemy of all spiritual and secular progress. The Master El Morio once said, each success depends upon knowledge, and if there is non-success somewhere, it means that ignorance has crept in. How many mistakes have each of us made in a lifetime that we could trace back to insufficient research, investigation, finding out, being hasty. If I only had known this, we say, if I had only known that, if I only knew then what I know today, I would not have made that mistake. That is the dullness of ignorance that descends as a film, perhaps as the dust that we will be receiving each 23rd of the month. Through A Dweller on Two Planets, a book by Philos the Tibetan, we can take a lesson on the karmic consequences of ignoring divine or human law. The book is a record of Atlantis as it was and of specific people who lived 13,000 years ago and today. Philos dictated the book to his amanuensis Frederick Oliver starting in 1883. It is his autobiography. In it, he gives us an historical view of ancient Atlantis. Then he traces the reincarnation of himself and others in 19th century America. The conclusions are compelling. I recommend this book to every chila of El Moria, to everyone on the spiritual path. These conclusions lay the foundation for my lecture today. To extract the lessons learned the hard way by the key figures in A Dweller on Two Planets, I will give you a profile of their psychology and their deeds. If we can put ourselves in the position of these individuals, these characters in the book, and wonder where we were 13,000 years ago and why we are here today, we will take the greatest lesson from this book and this lecture. Let us take up Zalem Numinos of Atlantis. Zalem was an incarnation of the master Philos the Tibetan. It is around 11,000 BC. Zalem is born a poor mountaineer whose father died when he was young. Zalem's dream is to someday hold a position of high rank. He enrolls in the College of Science in Kaifu, the capital, finds favor with the emperor, and works his way up the ladder of Atlantean society. He does so well that while still a student, he is adopted by Prince Menax, the emperor's chief advisor. Zalem has always seen himself as being close to his mother. All of his life, he has idolized her. Now in the light of his sudden good fortune, he looks forward to her sharing his new life with him in the prince's palace. But she has other plans. After Zalem is adopted by Menax, she informs her son that she has just married her old lover and plans to live with him in the mountain country where they came from. She reveals to Zalem that she detested his father and married him against her will. Then she tells him, Thou art the fruit of that union, and to me came unwished. For thy father was disliked aboard, but dying left you erator, not of my dislike. That were too unjust, but must I say it, an object of indifference. I have not been a lacking mother, for as a matter of pride I concealed my feelings from you. In a way I even love thee. I love thee as I love my friends. Tis nothing deeper. His mother's confession that she hated his father and never really loved him either so shocks Zalem that he falls unconscious to the floor before she has even finished speaking. For two weeks he is near death with what he describes as brain fever but is nursed back to health at the palace of Prince Menax. Because his mother is such a painful subject to Zalem from that time on no one refers to her again. This is a major turning point in Zalem's life. In number 12 of my Summit University lecture series on a dweller on two planets, 
I use this incident to analyze Zalem's psychology. I then discuss the factors of karma and reincarnation as they pertain to the psychology of the soul. Zalem's life is a case study that shows us how important it is to come to grips with these forces. Both Zalem and his mother have levels of ignorance that result in grave consequences. Because of Zalem's idolatry of his mother, he chooses not to know, that is, to ignore his mother's indifference toward him during his childhood and even when he was a young adult. Often when a child is confronted with the hatred of one or both parents, it is too painful for him to deal with. He may not even allow it to register, or if he does, he will quickly suppress it. Parental hatred of the child creates confusion in the child as to what love really is. To resolve this, the child in later years may be drawn to a person or persons like his father or mother. It could be a friend or marriage partner who will treat him the same way his parents did, apparently loving on the surface, but hateful and spiteful at subsurface levels. As an adult, Zalem is still living out a childhood fantasy. The question we all must ask ourselves, are we as adults still living out childhood fantasies? And are we willing to go through what it takes to resolve these divisions in our psyche? Zalem wants his mother to be a fairy tale fulfillment of motherhood. His soul is yearning for the mutual adoration of the Divine Mother and the Divine Man-Child, an archetypal reality he has not known in this life. No matter what his mother says or does, Zalem practices ignorance. He willfully ignores the reality that is staring him in the face, and he continues to deny his mother's hatred of him when she tells him point blank, I cannot go to the palace. I have no desire to do so. Thy father I loved not, but did detest. Thou art the fruit of that union, and to me came unwished. The hatred that comes across in his mother's rejection impacts him full force, and he goes into a coma. Zalem's mother's ignorance is an ignoring of the law of love. It is a willful and malicious act. She carries over her hatred of Zalem's father to Zalem himself. Psychologists call this unconscious transference of feeling displacement. Zalem's mother has no desire to develop the sacred fire of the heart to establish a loving relationship either with her husband or her son or with Inkle. Inkle is the one god who is worshipped in Atlantean monotheism. Instead of perfunctorily fulfilling her role as mother, she could have mastered her karma, mastered the law, and given real love, God's love, to Zalem. And she could have satisfied the psychological needs of both of them to experience the mother-son relationship. At the point that Zalem is adopted, she could have said, you've found your place now and it's time for me to go back to my country. I've seen you through your years of growing up, and now you are to start a new life in the palace. You will always be my son, but this is not the life for me. Instead, with utter cruelty, she tells him she never wanted to give birth to him in the first place, and has always felt indifferent toward him. In reality, Zalem's mother is jealous of his accomplishments. She has never resolved her archetypal hatred of father and son, and so she vents her anger against God upon the father of her son and her son. She is a witting or unwitting tool of evil forces that would use her to destroy her son. She is the anti-mother who embodies the anti-Christ. The evil forces intend to use her to kill the Christ before it is born in Zalem. The blow he suffers from her rejection is pivotal in his failure to pass his spiritual tests. And this is the point I wish to emphasize. Parental rejection of the child can be the deciding factor in whether a soul will make it 
on the spiritual path. The Guru Chila relationship must be based on a solid, loving, disciplined, open, and enlightened relationship between parents and their child. In the case of our community, parents first and foremost must see to it that they bond with their children at every stage of the child's development. The community is not a substitute for this relationship. Parents who let the community bring up their children are sowing seeds of hatred, hatred toward the parents who are their very first gurus when in the very first moment of life they open their eyes and look up into the faces of their father and mother. It sows seeds of hatred for the church, for the mother as well. This results then in the denial of the teachings, for they see their parents' non-accountability as parents, as invalidating the teaching and the path. This in turn puts a wall between the children and the messenger. Beloved El Moria has told me that parents who do not deal with their own rebellion against God, the guru and hence the messenger, transfer that attitude to their offspring from the moment of conception. This is why Moria had me require all parents who have children in our schools to take the course in parenting taught by Dr. Barbara Ann Luby and Dr. Marilyn Barrick. The first part is a lecture series that covers topics such as child abuse and its prevention and how to raise a responsible child. Parents as well as single people have attended this course because it teaches you not only how to be a good parent of your children, but also how to parent your own inner child. I know people who understand the mechanics of their psychology, the psychology of difficulties with their own parents, and yet they cannot help themselves. They turn right around and have the same divisions and difficulties with their own children. The course also covers how your inner child impacts your relationship with others and your parenting skills. The second part of this course is a program entitled Systematic Training for Effective Parenting. This program uses videos, exercises, and discussion groups to help parents be more effective in communicating with and disciplining their children. These skills in turn help their children to be self-reliant to be more responsible for their choices and behavior. Dr. Luby will be holding workshops on how to heal the inner child and raise a responsible child in our teaching centers throughout the United States. We will also be implementing in several grades of our school a new program called the Quest Program. This program is aimed at helping young people who are alienated and disconnected from society by creating family, school, community partnerships. The program teaches children, teachers, and parents how to communicate meaningfully, resolve conflicts, and set goals. It teaches children honesty, trust, and the three R's, responsibility, relationships, respect. The program has a strong focus on service. Children develop a service project that enables them to give something back to their school or church or community. They learn to work in groups as a team to accomplish their goals. The program also emphasizes the involvement and training of parents, teachers, and other community leaders. Adults learn how to contribute to the positive development of children of all ages through building trust, confidence, and opening up channels of communication. I have a very important film to show you on this subject. It is under an hour, and also one of our members to come and explain to you in greater detail what the Quest program is all about. It is a nationwide program, and it is affecting positively the lives of millions of children today. So getting back to our story, the judgment of non-worth that Zalem's mother places on him, he then places on himself almost as the mark of Cain. Whether you are a parent or someone who is influential in another person's life, the value that you consciously or subconsciously place on that person may limit that person 
for many lifetimes. If you are in that position of teacher or leader or someone over someone, they will take on your feelings, the subtleties of your assessment of them. The gravity of committing the crime of criticism, condemnation, and judgment of other people is far-reaching for the very reason that that assessment may be lodged in the unconscious of the person, the person who you are judging, without their knowledge, because they are open to you. And so it just slips inside and begins to be that person's self-image. So the value we give to our children, the, val the value we give to ourselves, this value becomes somehow the equation of our selfhood. And so it becomes a mark of Cain on Zalem. The soul computes. If I am not worthy to be loved by God the mother in the person of my own mother, then how can I be worthy to be the Christ? How can I be worthy to pass my tests? The absence of self-worth is the denial of one's real self in God. It is the most pernicious lie that can be heaped upon the children of God. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva have explained the plight of the soul who allows herself to accept this lie. In their dictation given through me, they told us that I am is the name of God. Therefore, to deny your self-worth by saying, I am not worthy, is to take God's name in vain. They said to say, I am not worthy is to say, God is not worthy. God in me is not worthy. I am worthless. When you are worthless and so say it, beloved, you have denied all God within you. The alcoholic says, I am worthless, therefore I drink. The smoker says, I am worthless, therefore I allow the demons of nicotine into my brain and temple. The one who surfeits himself in sugar and sweets does say the same. I am worthless. I do not deserve to be. Therefore, I shall enter into the destruction of my temple and my soul. I received a call from a keeper of the flame saying, my husband is suicidal. This is someone in a distant state. At what point in the life of that soul, this embodiment, or 10,000 years ago, was the seed planted I am not worthy to live. And how much do all of the substances that people take in increase and bear down upon that sense of worthlessness? In the lecture I gave on the psychology of Zalem, I discussed the ramifications of his mother's rejection. From that point on, he is unconsciously driven to play out his unresolved relationship with his mother through his relationships with other women. This has dire consequences. As the plot thickens, we see Zalem embroiled in an affair with Lolix. Lolix, in his unconscious mind, represents the bad mother. At the same time, he is deeply in love with his twin flame, Anzame. Anzame, in his unconscious mind, represents the good mother. His affair with Lolix is his attempt to resolve his feelings of guilt. He believes that somehow he is the cause of his mother's hatred of him. And this is the position of the child, always to take the point of responsibility to say it's my fault that my parents did this or that. He tells himself, if only I love Lolix enough, somehow the bad mother will become the good mother and will finally love me back. He cannot let go of his need for his human mother to love him. For him, as for us all, our human mother represents the Divine Mother. When Zalem embarks on his secret affair with Lolix, he knows he is violating the law, and he chooses to ignore the voice of conscience. What we find so amazing about this scene is that Zalem knows and loves his twin flame. But the love of twin flame 
for twin flame is not enough so long as there is that gnawing schism in his psyche that his human mother has not loved him his human mother then becomes the bad mother the archetypal mother and he cannot get on with the high relationship of his twin flame until he is satisfied by some way or another that he can receive the love of his human mother you can see just how devastating this is to the path would you ever think that you could be in the presence of your twin flame and yet desire the love of another this is an incident of it and it is not isolated Zalem is even warned of this trial in his life by a stately old priest that he meets one night the tall white-haired gentleman prophesies the events of his life and death he tells Zalem when thou thinkest least to do sin then shall thy foot stumble and thou shalt commit a sin which shall be unto thee a pursuing fate inexorable even now in the days of thine innocence thou art treading upon the steps of thy destiny end of quote later in the book we find out that the priest was Jesus although Zalem never forgets his words when his test comes he ignores this voice of warning why because karma blinds karma puts thick scales over the eyes and the eyes of the soul and over conscience Zalem is temporarily desensitized to the law because of his passions the divisions in his psyche and his karma they are such an overwhelming and driving force that even the memory of the voice of Christ does not deter him Philos writes of his thoughts at the time did I think of the mysterious stranger whom I had heard in awe in the first of my life at Kai Fool yea I thought of these things I thought of Inkle and I said Inkle my God if I am about to do wrong in thy sight in disregarding the laws of society and marriage smite me dead ere I sin Inkle smote, says Philos, not then, but afterwards through the ages. He smote not then. Conscience slept the sounder, but passion awoke. This is an amazing act to defy God and say, Smite me if I am about to do wrong. Smite me dead. I was once in the presence of a dark soul when he stood on a mountain and challenged God to strike him dead it was a terrifying experience for me since my life was being threatened both in that moment and daily I was simply aghast at the defiance of this dark one and at the energy he mounted against the Godhead and me God did not strike him dead and he was thus emboldened to commit further crimes against the great law with seeming impunity and how true is the truism though the mills of the gods grind slowly yet they grind exceeding small the years of this one's defiance of God have lapsed into decades only God knows the centuries the millennia of the course of karma as like a comet or a great meteorite it makes a wide orb gathering unto itself momentums of like vibration I for one would not want to be there in the day of this hellions reckoning as Peter said and we must all consider this first day of the new year if the righteous scarcely be saved where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear let us then follow the course of karma in the life of righteous Zalem Zalem becomes a victim of his fate which is to say the victim of his karma he is the victim of the karma he made when he originally turned his back on the son of the I am that I am Zalem begins his path with good intentions 
but he is faced with an ever-widening schism between himself and a father he has barely known and not bonded to. He also must deal with a mother who carries in her breast the hated image of the father figure and transfers that image to her son. With these factors in play, he is unable to overcome his karmic challenges, his initiations in that life. The question you must ask yourself today as you face elements of your psychology and karma and the hand that life has dealt you, will I allow whatever it is that is a burden to me to thwart my victory, the victory of my career and my goals in this life, and the victory of my ascension? You must take a lesson a lesson from the great one, Philos the Tibetan, who today is an ascended master. Take a lesson from him and see that you do not have to go the same route that he went, for you have the violet flame. You have so much more in this dispensation of the age of Aquarius. The book opens by describing his pilgrimage to Pitak Rock, the highest mountain on Atlantis, where he gives his adoration to Inkel. He asks for Inkel's sponsorship in his education and in his rise to prominence. But Zalem's karmic material, that's what the masters call it, your karmic material, what is the stuff of your karma that the masters need to deal with and you need to deal with when you are asking for a dispensation? Zalem's karmic material is not adequate to the initiations he must pass to receive the crown of life through his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one of the keys to his failure is that he is beset by ignorance. First, his mother's ignorance of her responsibility to be the channel of God's love to her son creates a major upheaval in his life. And second, Zalem, carrying the lead weights of his karma and his psychology, ignores the voice of God and the voice of conscience. Zalem is stuck in the muck of the karma of past indulgences, in a sleepy ignorance that is returning full circle to clog the pores of his senses. Intellectually brilliant on the one hand, he is morally and spiritually dense on the other. And 13,000 years later, when he reincarnates in North America, he is still stuck until he balances his karma with the reincarnated Lolix. Only by balancing the karma of ignorance does he finally pierce through the veil of Maya and strip his soul of that ignorance which entrapped him in the first place. As he does this, he is in essence forgiving his human mother of 13,000 years ago and thereby moving closer to the heart of God. By truly loving Lolix and manifesting the qualities of the Christ toward her, she, the representative of his ancient mother, is transformed in his mind and therefore his ancient mother is also transformed. He forgives her. This, my beloved, is the wages of karma. As I said, karma blinds. And when you are blinded by your karma, you cannot see. Steeped in ignorance, you believe the lie that you are in possession of your full soul faculties. How then is anyone to escape the rounds of mayic illusion? I will tell you, you must be harnessed to a guru who sees and follow him until your full faculties are restored. The key problem of our world today, this January 1, 1993, is that it wallows in ignorance. Smug in its conceit, it is convinced it has no need for the guru. This is why St. Germain advocates the path of karma yoga and why he has given us the violet flame to accelerate our soul's path back to the point of self-awareness in the reality of God as opposed to the unreality of the self-ignorant state. After all is said and done, the only way out of the box in which the enemies of the light would lock us up is through the mercy of God that we make our own by being merciful to ourselves. 
A dweller on two planets provides another example of the karma for ignorance in the actions of the Saldis, also known as the Chaldeans. As far as we can surmise, the Saldis probably lived somewhere in the area where southern Iraq, Kuwait, and northern Saudi Arabia are today. The Saldis are a warlike people. Philos describes them as heartless barbarians who desire to devour whatever stands in their way. The Saldis exhibit a base ignorance that stems from their archetypal anger against God and against the indwelling God in the sons of the solitude. The sons of the t solitude, as you know, are the great adepts of the time. When we meet the Saldis in this book, they are marching towards the fertile land of Swern. Swern encompassed present-day India and parts of Arabia. Although the people of Swern have no physical defenses or armies, they are reputed to possess the power to destroy their enemies without using a single weapon. But as the Chaldean army heads toward the capital of Swern, they meet with no resistance. They spill no blood, but they do torture their captives for amusement. When the Chaldean army finally reaches the capital, Ernan the emperor walks out alone to meet them. He implores the chief of the Chaldean army to turn back before his soldiers are destroyed. The chief ignores his advice and only laughs in scorn. Then Ernan says, Thou hast been warned to leave. Thou hast heard of the power of the Swern and believed not. But now feel it. With these words, Ernan sweeps his finger over the place where the top 2,000 Chaldean soldiers are standing. Quietly he prays, Yehovah, strengthen my weakness. So dieth stubborn guilt. Instantly all of the veteran warriors fall dead to the ground. Then Ernan prays again, Lord, do thou this thing for thy servant, I beseech thee. Then one by one the soldiers rise and walk mechanically into the river until they disappear beneath the water. Filled with terror, the rest of the army flees, except for a few faithful soldiers. Ernan sends these soldiers back to their homeland but holds their chief captive in Swearn. Also present at this scene are some of the wives and daughters of the Chaldean officers. Ernan exiles them to Atlantis. The chief begs Ernan to be lenient with the women. He says, Mighty Rye, what wouldst thou with innocent women? Thou saidst my warriors were guilty. I admit it nor accept myself. But these, my women, they have harmed no man. Ernan, however, says that the women are not innocent. In other words, their ignorance is no excuse. Ernan says, Callest thou innocent women who voluntarily came in all the insolence of supposed power and invincibility to murder my people? Innocent? They who came to see the rapine of my cities and to revel in the sufferings of my people. Innocent, nay, not so. Thus, in the case of the Saldis, their ignorance of the law brings upon them death and calamity. When people allow the fire of hell to express through them, it consumes their mental faculties and dulls their soul sensitivities. It deprives them of gifts of the spirit that could give them discrimination and discernment. Anger against God is the root cause of all ignorance. Rage is such a powerful misqualification of the sacred fire that it actually consumes the cells of the brain. I have witnessed before my very eyes an individual consuming his own brain simply by anger and rage over a lifetime. The Swernies themselves provide another object lesson in the consequences of ignorance. When Zalem recovers from the trauma of his mother's rejection of him, Prince Menak sends him on a diplomatic mission to the land of Swern. Zalem presents a beautiful vase 
from the rye of Atlantis to Ernan, the rye of Swearn. Philos writes in A Dweller on Two Planets, Rye Ernan was far less interested in the vase and in other gifts of gold and gems than in the captive Saldani, whom the tokens commemorated, particularly in the Saldu, Lolix. Lolix is the daughter of the Chaldean chief. Philos says, I was startled at the monarch's close knowledge of my sickness and other incidents which were not matters of public note. But I betrayed no such feeling since it was but a momentary and passed as soon as recollection of Ernan's wonderful occult powers came to me. Speaking of the Saldui, but especially of Lolix, Ernan said, I did not send the Chaldeans unto Wallen as objects of lust, neither as retributive punishment, that by exile from their native Chaldea they might atone to swear and for their fathers, sons, brothers, or husbands, who worked harm to the Swearnies. No doubt they were not more blamable than is a tiger which hath a similarly destructive nature. But by the laws of Yeova, we find that ignorance of the law never exempts a wrongdoer from penalty. Law says in regard to sin, thou shalt not. And the penalty lies alongside, inexorably, and is dealt out unsparingly for disobedience. Law, therefore, appears not to be retributive, but educational. Having felt the punishment, no one, either man or animal, is apt to try the error twice out of curiosity. Nature makes no penalty easy, saying, when thou hast learned, then the punishment shall be more severe. If a babe fell over a cliff, its death would be the result, though its innocence knew nothing of sin, just as surely as a knowing man might meet the same fate deliberately. Now the Chaldean women needed to learn that conquest, bloodshed, and pillage is a sin. The Chaldean nation needed a lesson also. It received it in the death of its prize soldiery. But such examples need finish. A diamond in the rough is surely a diamond, but how much doth the lapidary increase its beauty and value? To not release unto them those women was to that nation what is the faceting to a gem. Thinkest thou not that I am right? Even so, Rai, I responded. For several days we remained in the capital, and during this time were escorted over it by no less a person than Rai Ernin himself. Philos goes on to describe the unusual powers of the Swernies. He says the Swerni never lift their hands in manual labor. They sit at the breakfast or the supper table without having previously put upon it anything to eat or elsewhere prepared or repast. They bow their heads in apparent prayer and then lifting up their eyes begin to eat of what has m mysteriously come before them, of wholesome viands, of nuts, of all manner of fruits and of tender succulent vegetables. But meat they eat not, nor much that is not the finished product of its source, containing in itself the germ for future life. Philos also notes that the people of Swearn had the power to demolish their enemies, even enemy planes and bombs, by simply gazing upon them. He says, we as Poseidon, that is Atlanteans, knew that the mysterious nations across the waters were possessed of abilities which virtually dwarfed our attainments, such as our power to traverse the aerial or marine depths, our swift cars, our subsurface sea ships. How to hinder one of the Swerni, no, no Poseida knew. Shut it in a dungeon, he would arise and go forth like Saul of Tarsus. He could see and hear to any distance, go through the midst of foes and be seen by none of them. Of what use are instruments of war even against such a people? A single man of whom, looking with eyes wherein glittered the terrible light of a willpower, exerted to hurl in retribution the unseen forces of the night side, could cause our foemen to wither as green leaves before the hot breath of fire. 
Philos notes that the Swernes did not use this power indiscriminately. They did not destroy life unnecessarily or even molest any of the enemy except the generals and directors of their forces. As I said earlier, Ernan had used this power for good to defend the Swernes against the Chaldean army. Some of the Swernes who have re-embodied to this day have retained a remnant of this power to destroy their enemies, as Philos says, by simply gazing upon them. But instead of using this power according to God's will, they have perverted it in what is known as the evil eye. The concept of the evil eye is an ancient belief that certain persons can project evil upon others through their glance, causing injury, illness, death, loss of honor or fortune to another, or destruction of another's possessions. The origins of this belief have been traced to the ancient Near East, India, and the Mediterranean cultures. The concept of the evil eye has persisted throughout the centuries to present-day cultures in many parts of the world. John H. Eliot writes in his article on the evil eye, Infants and children in particular are regularly considered among the most vulnerable victims of the evil eye. Persons enjoying sudden good fortune or favorable social status likewise are thought to be especially vulnerable to the envious evil eye. According to the ancient understanding of human anatomy and physiology, the eye was considered a channel to and from the heart, the locus of thought and intention. Rays emanating from the eye powerfully conveyed the dispositions of the heart. A good eye signaled an honorable and benevolent individual. An evil eye and its possessor, on the other hand, were judged malicious, spiteful, and dangerous. The glance and even presence of such an individual were to be avoided because through his evil eye he was thought to radiate malevolent and hostile intentions. These malevolent intentions generally were identified with hatred, envy, covetousness, and miserliness, the displeasure at another's health, success, and social standing, or the unwillingness to share one's own possessions or bounty with those in need. Socially, the evil eye comes into play when the sharing among haves and have-nots within the community is at issue. An evil eye accompanies a heart which is hardened and a hand which is shut to someone in need. Morally, the hostility of an evil eye is counted not only as an offense against another mortal, but as a sin against God. Thus, in Deuteronomy 15, the people of Israel are commanded, You shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need whatever it may be. Take heed lest there be a base thought in your heart and your eye be evil against your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cry to the Lord against you and it be counted as sin in you. People who believed in the evil eye considered it unlucky to have themselves or their possessions praised and often wore amulets or words from sacred texts to deflect the malignant glance. In the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, Jesus associates the evil eye with envy and resentment of another's good fortune. Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to the householder who pays the workers he hires for one hour as much as those who have been working in the vineyard the whole day. When the laborers who had worked the longest complained that their wage was not higher than those that had arrived last, the householder said, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called but few chosen. Putting this passage in context, John Eliot writes, According to Matthew's story, the evil eye is operative in persons who are unwilling to accept or emulate divinely sanctioned patterns of benevolence and largesse. In a fledgling Christian community where the poor were dependent on the generosity of the rich, to have an evil eye towards one's neighbor 
was to belie the generosity of one's God and undermine the fabric of one's community. The Ascended Masters have cautioned against bragging about your health, your wealth, your family, or your accomplishments for the very reason that people's jealousy gives impetus to the evil eye. The evil eye is the result of the misuse of the sacred fire through the third eye chakra. From this misuse comes the term, the withering glance. In his lecture entitled Momentum, Mark Prophet spoke about the dangers of the evil eye and how even subconscious negative thoughts can cause someone harm. I would like to play a segment of that lecture for you now. Please take notes on it. I think sometimes it's very good that people that are living objectively in physical bodies don't know too much about what they can do because if they did, they might create chaos for each other because most of the time you find people in this world that are not stabilized in their emotions. It's almost like that program Bewitched on television. I mean, if the girl doesn't like what you do, she goes like this, and the next thing you know, the guy's got horns growing on his head or anything else. And this is true. I mean, you see this in Bewitched. You see all kinds of things happening. Why? Because it's supposed to be witchcraft. We don't believe in witchcraft. We're not interested in that. But people are practicing witchcraft on each other in effect because many times when someone brags about something, and I learned this in the Middle East too. They told me about it over there. People brag about their children. Somebody puts what they call the evil eye on them, on the children. The children get sick and the children die. I heard that in Cairo. They definitely believe in what they call the evil eye. Well, whether you know it or not, the evil eye is simply people using the power of vision for evil. So what actually happens is somebody comes along and somebody says, gee, I got a wonderful business. I got a beautiful home. I got a beautiful wife. My kids are pretty. Everything's going fine for me. I'll become a millionaire in another year. Somebody says, aha. It's like the time we sent out one of our folders on the Summit Lighthouse, a world pillar. We sent it all over the country and one guy come back and he says, you say you're a world pillar. He says, I say you're not a world pillar. And he says, you never will be again. He says, I'm the high mucky muck from some big planet up here. He wrote us this letter and he says, I met with people in spaceships up in New York, he says. And so he says, you were a world pillar and you'll never be a world pillar again. <laughs> but the point is, there's always somebody that's jealous of you. So don't be so foolish as to tell people all your wonderful things, what you can do or what you have done or how happy you are. There are people that are jealous of your happiness. Be smart and silent. For silence is golden. Silence is golden because it will avoid the mass mind from closing in on you. There's a lot of you people that are not aware of the evil power that is in human evil eyes. Not evil eyes from a standpoint of witchcraft or some spooky thing, but human beings that may be, and I'm not running down you blessed older ladies, but maybe a white haired old lady or maybe a young gal that looks like a saint. You can't tell. Anybody can have an evil eye in the sense that they have an evil power of vision. They're jealous, in other words. And jealousy is what creates losses. People see someone and someone sees them and then this person decides that they don't like it because this person is successful. So they think inside, I wish something would happen to them. A lot of times it's a subconscious thought. Did you know that? It doesn't have to be a conscious thought. It can just be a subconscious feeling of, well, I'm not that way. Why should they be that way? People forget that every thought that they think is their responsibility. They forget that if someone dies because they think a bad thought, that they're accountable for that person's death. People do not understand responsibility. They think they can get away with something in this universe. We get away with nothing. We're just kidding ourselves if we think we do. So you go out and build constructive momentum instead of destructive momentum. And keep silent before people. Speaking about witchcraft, we receive a lot of phone calls about our cable TV shows and we're very grateful that so many of you are keeping us on the air in your hometown. 
And this one woman wrote in, I, I think uh, she didn't write, she called up on the telephone and expressed how she so much enjoyed a certain program and then she added, uh, currently I'm a witch. And I thought that this was fun, so funny because it was like a phase, you know, right now I happen to be a witch, and, but I really enjoyed the show. <clears throat> well, despite their unusual gifts, the Swearneys had a troublesome side to their character. Philos writes, it was a strange people, the Swearney. The elder people seemed never to smile, not because they were engaged in occult study, but because they were filled with wrath. On every countenance seemed to rest a perpetual expression of anger. Why, I pondered, should this thing be? I noticed in our visits in and about the capital a thing which cast a shadow over me, that his people did not love Ernan, however much they respected him and feared his power. That the rye was aware of my knowledge of this dislike was obvious from his conversation. Ours is a peculiar people, Prince, he said to me. During many centuries, the rulers that reigned over them came from the ranks of the sons of the solitude. Each and every one hath striven to train his subjects so as to fit some future generation as an entire people for initiation into the mysteries of the night side of nature deeper than thy people of Poside have ever dreamed of going. To this end, moral codes have been insisted upon as a coefficient of tuition in operative magic. But the endeavor hath never produced the end sought. Only here and there hath an individual arisen and progressed. Soon every one of these hath fled away from the less energetic people and gone to the solitudes to become one of the sons of whom thou mayest have heard. Generally we term these students sons. Specifically we would have to refer to them as sons or daughters, for sex is no bar to occult study. That's the end of quote. Philos writes, it had long been a matter of interest to me to learn all I could of this band of nature students, the sons of the solitude. They were sometimes called inkalines, from inkal, God, to in, meaning study. Thousands of years later, in the time of Jesus of Nazareth, these were called as scenes. As I now listened to Rye Ernan, my interest was reawakened, and I thought I might one day become a candidate for admission to the order, if, but that if was of large size. If the study renders the student so wrathful in soul as I see the Swerney are, then I will have nothing to do with it. The seed was planted, however, and grew a little when I learned that the angry gloom was not due to occult study, except in the sense that the lower nature was rebellious against the purity of the study and cast up the mud of anger, rendering turbid the clear waters of the soul. It grew more when the rye remarked later on that the girl Anzime would one day be an Inkalenu. But the growth was not great in that olden time. It was reserved for a life to come when decades upon decades of centuries had flown till now. Stop and think when the seed was planted in you. I want to realize who I am in God. I want to be an adept on the path. Was it 14,000 years ago or 35,000 years? A seed perhaps dormant through lifetimes of intense karma. A seed always there, coming to the surface at least a couple of times per lifetime until you could find that direct path to God. Ernan continued, Ye of Poside, dip a little into the night side and behold, out of it ye gather forces which open the penetralia of the sea and of the air and subject the earth. Tis well. But ye require physical apparatus. Without it ye are nothing powerful. Those versed in occult wisdom, 
need no apparatus. That is the difference between the Poseidi and the Swernes. The human mind is a link between the soul and the physical. Every higher force controls all those lower. The mind operates through odic force, which is higher than any speed of physical nature, hence controls all nature, nor needeth apparatus. Now I and my brother sons of the solitude before me have striven to teach the Swerni the laws which govern the operation of this force. Through this knowledge, Jehovah lendeth his children strength. Hand in hand with this knowledge are physical acts, powers that come early in the study. So far have they gone, but will no farther go. Morality aids serenity of soul, hence it is profitable to the inkaline, above all things, to be moral. But man is an animal in his corporeal self, and the passions thereof are pleasant. Love is of twofold nature, love of God and of the spirit, pure and undefiled, and love of sex, which may likewise be pure. Though if the dominion of the animal in man be over it, and not so that of the human, it shall cause the man to sin, for then it is lust. I have sought that the swearney may know the law, so that they may be the masters, not the creatures of circumstance. But because they know a few things of magic, and in the greater feats were aided by the sons dwelling amongst them, lo, they are content. And behold, they rebel against punishment on account of the lustful nature they do indulge, and curse me mightily because I exact obedience to the law and penalty for the infraction thereof. And they curse my brother's sons who do aid me. Therefore is their wrath which it hath so troubled thee to witness. My people do things strange in thy sight, O Poseida, yet have no wisdom why it is so, and work their wonders heedless of Jehovah. Wherefore they are a brood of sorcerers, and do not work white magic which is beneficent, but black magic which is sorcery. It shall work them exceeding woe. I would, O Zalem of Poseid, have taught these my people faith, hope, knowledge, and charity, which same make pure religion undefiled. Have I not done well? Wallen, my brother, have I not done well? Philos writes, Rai Ernin was sitting in the salon of the Veilx, which is an airship, and now addressed Wallen of Poseid, whom I saw in the Naim as I looked around. The Naim is a combination of telephone and television. Verily thou hast done well, even so, my brother, said Wallen. For some moments the noble ruler was silent, and I could see teardrops falling occasionally from beneath his closed eyelids. Then he opened his eyes and began a most touching apostrophe to and in some sort against his people. O oh, Swernes, Swernes, I have given up my life for thee. I have striven to lead thee unto a speed, to teach thee of its beauties, and thou wouldst not. I have tried to make thee van, in the vanguard of all nations, and thy name synonym with justice and mercy, and love of God. And how hast thou requited me? I would be as a father to thee, and thou didst curse me in thy heart. Keener than knives is ingratitude. I would have led thee to the heights of glory, but thou wouldst rather lie in wallow of ignorance like swine, content to do what are marvels to other people, but thyself all ignorant of their import. Thou art an infidel in great race, believing not in Jehovah, content to live by the little thou knowest, too slothful to learn, more ungrateful to Jehovah than to thy rye. O Swernes, Swernes, thou hast cast me off and made my heart to bleed. I go. From thy midst the sons go also, a mournful band of disappointed men, and thou shalt become few where thou art many, a derision before men and a prey to the Chaldeans. 
Yea, thou shalt dwindle and shalt wait until the centuries, even ninety centuries are fled into eternity. And in that day thou shalt suffer until the time of him who shall be called Moses. And of them it shall be said, they are the seed of Abraham. And behold, even as now the Spirit of God is abroad in the land, imminent in the sons of the solitude, and ye do mock it, so in a remote day shall his Spirit become manifest, and shall incarnate as the Christ. And so shall the perfect human glow with the Spirit, and become first of the sons of God. Yet shalt thou even then know him not, but shall crucify him. And thy punishment shall go down the ages until that spirit comes again in the hearts of those who do follow him and finds thee scattered to the four winds. Thus shalt thou be punished. From now until then thou shalt earn thy bread by the sweat of thy face. Thou shalt no more have the regal power of defense lest thou use it for offense. I will no more restrain thee, my people, O oh my people. Ungrateful, I forgive thee, for thou canst not know how I love thee. I go, O oh Swearnes, Swearnes, Swearnes. At the last word, the noble ruler's voice lowered to a murmur, and he buried his tearful face in his hands and sat bowed in silent grief, except for a sigh of sorrow which once or twice he uttered. Several Swerny had heard his words, and these now left the Velks very quietly and went to the city. I turned to the Naim as these words were uttered and noted that a great shade of sadness rested upon the face of our own Rye, Wallen, as he looked upon Ernan, like himself, an adept son. Raini Inkel Mo Navaza Mindi Su, which being translated is To Inkel the Rai, to the country of departed spirits, he is gone. Startled, I looked around at the Swearn Rai, who still sat silent as before in the same position. I spoke to him, yet he gave no sign. Then I bent and gazed through his fingers into his fine gray eyes. They were set indeed, and the breath of life was fled. Yea, verily he had gone, even when he said, I go. At Rye Wallen's direction, Salem tells the Swearney ministers that Ernan had wanted Rye Wallen to govern the Swearneys following his death. When the ministers hear this, all but two who are the sons of the solitude are enraged. One of the ministers tries to kill Zalem by his occult powers. He points his finger at Zalem and says, then die. I did not outwardly shrink, writes Philos, though half expecting to perish on the spot. But much to the minister's surprise, Nothing happens. With their ruler's death, he and all the Swernies lose their powers, as Ernan had foretold. They can no longer precipitate their own food or call forth instantaneous powers of destruction. In order to survive, they have to learn the basics of agriculture, husbandry, mining, and spinning under the guidance and training of the Atlanteans. The story of the Swernies is a story of the karma of rebellion against the law and the lawgiver. Because Rai Ernin forced the Swernies to obey a strict moral code as a prerequisite to their enjoying the use of occult powers, such as precipitating their food, they cursed Ernin in their hearts. Content with what they knew of the laws governing what occult powers they had been given, the Swernies made no effort to increase their knowledge. They were too slothful to learn and master the higher laws that govern the control of nature. They did not aspire to greater attainment for the sake of themselves or their fellow man. Among the 85 million people who inhabited that subcontinent, very few became spiritually advanced. Ernan, on the other hand, had learned to use the powers of Inkel only for good, 
or for self-defense, or as he was the instrument of a just karmic retribution, as in the case of the Chaldean attack on his nation. He was in a right relationship, loving and obedient to his guru under Sanat Kumara. He therefore earned the right to command the cosmic forces, and they obeyed him. But the powers exercised by the common people had been derived solely through the guru Chila relationship. It was their guru who had had the attainment. Through love, he had transferred certain powers to them in return for their token obedience. Thus, when their guru passed on, the Swernis lost their powers. Their hatred of the guru was the karma that cut the tie whereby they lost those powers. Without love, there is no fulfilling of the law of the guru Chila relationship. Love is its foundation and its fulfillment. The Swaranis were ungrateful to God, and they were ungrateful to their leader, Ernan. Their ingratitude was so great that they did not appreciate the opportunity they had to become true masters of themselves, of the elements, and of their nation. It is a sad, sad story. Imagine then, if you live today under a benevolent despot such as Ernan, for this is how the people saw him, and this is how they hated him. And this benevolent despot would offer you ultimate powers, if only you would love him, obey him, keep his commandments, and practice the exercises he would give you for your personal adeptship. All you would have to do is to trust and obey and love him, and you could have the all power of heaven and earth. Well, the truth of the matter is that you do have this benevolent despot over you and in your midst. It is your very own beloved El Moria. He is the genie who comes bearing the lamp of self-knowledge. He is limited in what he can do, what he can ultimately do for you, only by your karma, only by your chilaship and your be attitude, that is your psychology. Believe me, El Moria will take you as far as you will allow him by your actions, by your purity of heart and motive, and your will to realize your fullest potential in God. He can take you just so far and no farther than you allow him. Yes, another Ernan, Rye of Swearn, is in our midst. Will we treat him as the Swernese treated Ernan and wait another 13,000 years for our next golden opportunity, that is, if there is one? Or shall we take the tide of the Darjeeling Master at its flood and let it lead us on to fortune? These are deep questions we all must ponder at the new year, then make our resolutions and keep them. Sometimes I think that El Moria has made vows to each one of us personally far greater than the vows that we have made to him. He has, after all, sponsored this activity since 1961 and since he began to train Mark Prophet in the early 1950s. He has sponsored us in all of our moves, in all of our trials, in all of our mistakes, in all of our humanness, in all of the things we have done that are out of the line of the law. Moria is still there. He has endured through his being benched because of us and then being unbenched because of us. And he is yet with us today. Think how faithful the master is to his chilas. Let's see if we can match it in this year and see what great good accrues to each of us wherever we are. Ignorance can be the karma for rebellion against the laws of God, the science of God, in many past lives. It is not necessarily your genes or environmental factors that determine your intelligence. It is the history of your soul, the karma of your soul. Each of us is meant to embody the mind of God. Paul taught this to the Philippians when he wrote, Let that mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The karma for refusing or neglecting to use the faculties of the mind of God is a diminishing of those faculties. 
This is a vicious circle because ignorance begets ignorance and dullness begets dullness. Does the beast of the field know he is a dumb beast? I suspect the smartest of the lot looks upon the others as dumb beasts. <laughs> All is relative. When you are ignorant, you are less and less able to know God or to receive the gifts of his wisdom. This burden can be with the soul lifetime after lifetime. I personally think that our society and the programming of television and motion pictures and all that we engage in, the very lowest levels of what they call music today, all of this is dulling the fine-tuned senses that we came into life with. Other, so other consequences of ignorance of the law are that your threefold flame can be reduced. You can lose your bonding to your Christ self, and you can let go of the hand of your guru. Finally, you can become so ignorant of God and the spiritual path that you can no longer find your way back to God. We are all experiencing this to some degree. In ancient golden ages, we were able to walk and talk with the masters. We had certain spiritual powers. When in past embodiments we rebelled against the laws of God, we began to lose our attunement with our real self and our God. That is why we desperately need the ascended masters. We need the guru to guide us back to God. Above all and first of all, we need Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When God created you and me, he gave us a divine spark that we call the threefold flame of life. If we have allowed our threefold flame to be snuffed out by wanton disobedience or neglect, we need Jesus Christ to reignite our threefold flame. If we have lost that contact, that close contact with our real self, our holy Christ self, Jesus can help us reestablish the bonding of our soul to that holy Christ self. These things can take place only as we embrace the path of discipleship, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and his apostles. As I have explained to you in my previous lectures on a dweller on two planets, the role of Jesus Christ as Savior is that he has taken upon himself the burden of our sins or karma so that we might live again to balance our own karma. Jesus did not wipe the slate clean with his crucifixion. Jesus set aside our sins and he forgave our sins. This means we must still pay our debts to life when we reach a level of spiritual maturity in our own Christhood. For the law says, every man must bear his own burden, and that means the burden of his karma. The law of God requires that once we have progressed to a certain place on the path, we must take back upon ourselves the weight of our sins or karma. We are expected to balance our karma through service, good works, through invoking the violet flame of the Holy Spirit, and through pure love of God in devotions. The fact is that we wouldn't even be an embodiment today if it were not for God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness. The sins we have committed through our past lives are so great that they would long ago have canceled out our opportunity to be in existence at all. Had not Jesus volunteered to bear our karma, our souls would have already gone through the second death that is spoken of in the book of Revelation. At least a couple of times of year, we ought to think about that fact. We are here by the grace of God. This is the meaning of the passage in Ephesians. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not by anything that you have done. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That means God has prepared our divine plan, our calling, what we must accomplish. He has prepared and outlined those good works that we must do in order to return to his heart. 
The doctrine that Orthodox Christianity teaches today, that Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, is a dangerous doctrine. It is a doctrine propagated by Satan and his seed to deprive the people of the accountability for their actions. It is a half-truth because Jesus did pay the price for the sins of humanity. The other side of the equation is that humanity must rise to the level of their own Christhood and pay that debt and take back upon themselves what Jesus has carried for them. This mistaken teaching known as the doctrine of the vicarious atonement is a willful ignorance or ignorance of the laws of God and his son Jesus Christ. It denies the true doctrine which states that good works when done to the glory of God are the means to balance karma, to pay one's debts to life, to set the record straight. James teaches that Abraham was justified by works and not faith only. James says, seest thou how faith was active along with Abraham's works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So God imputed righteousness to Abraham because he had faith. But Abraham's faith was made tangible by his works. And because he had a right heart, and his works were done to the glory of God, his works counted toward the balancing of karma. The doctrine of the vicarious atonement also denies the law of reincarnation. Reincarnation is the mercy of God. Through reincarnation, God has given your soul the opportunity to correct the mistakes of past lives and to do penance for those mistakes. People believe that Jesus atoned for their sins and that they are scot-free because they want to believe it. But deep down, in the schism of their own psyche, they are in rebellion against God. They are not willing to take accountability for their infraction of the laws of God and man. Following the example of the fallen angels, instead of the example of Jesus Christ, they want somebody else to pay the price for everything. The truth of the matter is that God has sent Jesus to be our Savior, not alone in his final incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth, but in every 2,000-year cycle. 35,000 years ago, Jesus was the emperor of a golden age on Atlantis, and 17,000 years ago, he appeared for 434 days to establish on Atlantis the Maxin Light, which we call the Flame of the Ark of the Covenant and to establish the laws to govern the people. He also materialized on Atlantis and elsewhere on the planet where he was needed when the people's good karma and allegiance to the Godhead warranted his intercession. Jesus has appeared to each one of us on our path. In a dweller on two planets, Jesus appears to Zalem three times. First, as an old priest who prophesied the challenges he would meet in his life as Zalem, as I already mentioned. Then later in the book, when Zalem is grieving, Jesus appears to him and comforts him. Jesus tells Zalem that he will receive mercy for his sins, but that he must bring back to God's heart those he has led astray. All of us must take this to heart. It is not too difficult to lead people astray with an unkind word or a condemnation that has with it such energy that people abandon their hopes, their plans, their calling in life. We must know that by the calls we have today to God, the science of the spoken word, we can call to go out in our finer bodies. We can call that the angels of God will bring back to the path of God all whom we have led astray, especially through false doctrine when we were not enlightened. The third time Zalem sees Jesus is at the hour of his death 
when the Christ again prophesies his future. What do we learn from these episodes in Salem's life? For one thing, we learn that the presence of Jesus is not meant to be a unique experience. Zalem was worthy by good works in past lives, and in this one, he was worthy. At some level of his being, he was the pupil who was ready, and the teacher appeared. This experience can happen to you if walking and talking with your Lord and Savior becomes the chief goal in your life one you put before all others as you go about your daily calling. But in order to achieve this goal, you must study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. You must eliminate the poison of ignorance. We come, therefore, to the wall, the stone wall of ignorance, our own ignorance that is set before us, and we realize that all of the things that we desire to do in life will be thwarted if we don't stop right now and work on our ignorance regarding ourselves, our psychology, our heart, our mind, all that makes us up, the real self, the unreal self. Think of anything you want to do that is worthwhile today. And I will wager you will have to get rid of some pocket of ignorance in your life in order to be successful at it.